I have the record of most slides because I'm afraid badly you're not there. So I'm going to go into a bit of detail uh, as Jesse has on some of the function calls. There's no code as such. Um, I'm going to try to go reasonably quickly. Um, so if you're confused, please try to look obviously confused and I'll slow down. Uh, if you're bored, please try to look obviously bored and I'll uh, try to speed up a bit. Um, if I start you on it, it's not because I'm bored, it's because I've been awake since 5.15, so please just look across at me and I'll keep you awake out of stress. Um, okay, so frameworks. Uh, so we've heard a lot about, uh, generally speaking, with Vulkan, the way that it's intended to make uh, use of the GPU more efficient from the CPU's perspective. Uh, so, as Michael was saying earlier, we have ways of generating lots of work using multiple GPU calls, writing to separate command buffers. Uh, we've got the ability to reuse those command buffers, which stops the CPU having to do anything at all. Uh, and you can uh, reuse those command buffers across multiple frames or multiple submissions, potentially. Um, we've got direct control over memory management, which is intended to uh, make sure that you're not waiting so much uh, between GPU calls. Uh, and you've got proper control over when the shaders are happening, um, through a bug one, it's that level of control. So the message we've had from a lot of people so far is that the, uh, the way that uh, Vulkan is intended to help is to reduce the amount of load on the CPU side and keep the GPU as busy as possible. Um, but it doesn't necessarily help if you're already stuck on the GPU side, uh, because there's no magic and your GPU will already go as fast as the GPU is going. Uh, except that's not always the case. So there are some things in Vulkan that are intended to make things go a bit quicker. Um, and one of the problems with GL is that it was basically Iris GL, which was designed for how uh, Silicon Graphics imagined everything was going to work uh, in the 1990s, and that's not really how modern, particularly mobile hardware works. Um, so the way that mobile hardware is being designed is specifically intended to reduce the memory bandwidth, which is the, the biggest problem that we have in mobile, and therefore the mappings that we have uh, between GL and GLDS, and where the hardware works isn't quite perfect. Uh, the drivers do a brilliant job most of the time, but it is only most of the time. <coughs> um, so, I hope everyone here knows about our GPUs. I will be very quick in case. Uh, bandwidth is the problem. Uh, so, you take the scene, you throw it at some binning hardware or something, um, which splits it up into regions of this uh, screen and works out which uh, primitives touch which areas of the screen, uh, then you render each of those, rooms, uh, those regions of the screen in turn, effectively. And by having uh, on-chip hard uh, memory for uh, those regions of the screen, it avoids you going out to main memory every time, and that makes everything go nice and fast. Uh, so you have nice, uh, fast on-chip memory, and you don't have to worry about your tiny little external uh, bus to deal with your low power RAM. So you can avoid, one of the main reasons this is efficient is that you uh, need quite a lot of data for each pixel when you're rendering, but you don't need it all the time. So for example, you need Z buffer and stencil buffer to be able to uh, do your calculations. Uh, you need to render it full screen, uh, more than full screen resolution in order to get multi-sampling. Um, but when you're actually rendering something, you only care about the final down sample version. You don't need the Z, you don't need the stencil, you don't need the original resolution image. Um, so you only care about the tiny little version. Uh, and we can throw away the other two. Uh, and hopefully you're hearing that in GPS. So uh, the other things you don't need to load anything from previous sprints, so you're not pulling data back out of memory to continue memory. Uh, but sometimes we actually do need the results of some previous rendering in, in full detail. Uh, so in obvious case is shadow maps, where you need to produce the Z buffer before you can start accessing it. Uh, you can do environment maps, you can be rendering that the entire scene is uh, a blue image uh, for doing HDR effects. Um, but the good news is that you can often get away with uh, lower resolution or some other form of reduced bandwidth when you're doing maps, so they're not huge, they're not quite such big bandwidth pulls uh, as the normal frame buffer is. But sometimes you actually do need to do all this rendering at the full resolution of the frame buffer. Um, so uh, hands up if you've used deferred rendering. Cool. Okay. In that case, I won't make people stick their hands up to uh, say the other questions. Um, so that's 
one example where you need to write to lots of uh, intermediate data. Uh, if I'm writing a similar problem, more intermediate passes, possibly less data at any given point. Um, <coughs> transparency, again, uh, useful to write to more than one lot of data when you're trying to resolve what the transparency is supposed to look like. Uh, tone mapping, another thing where you might want to remember everything and then do tone mapping afterwards. Um, so, how do you want to implement those? Um, the most simple case is you just render to each of those uh, intermediate buffers separately. Um, that's a really bad thing to do. Um, so that there is a bit more of a cost for using geometry on a time limit. Um, it might not be very much, but generally speaking, because you have to do something every bit, um, the cost is a little bit more. Uh, and uh, if you're going to go over the scene multiple times once for each of these intermediate images, then you don't have a problem that uh, you effectively process more geometry. Um, that's not really a big problem here. And uh, even immediate mediate over don't love like you doing this kind of ranking where you have to process everything repeatedly. Um, so the way you get around this on a desktop system is you use multiple render targets. You write out to multiple front numbers in a single pass. Um, and while that reduces the amount of geometry you have to process, you're still writing all of this data to external memory, which is fine for a desktop chip that's an immediate mode renderer with vast external bandwidth. Um, and not really very good for mobile. Um, the other thing is that uh, because you're writing to more stuff from one shader, you're putting more requirements and capabilities of those shaders. So that could potentially slow things down or create as well. Um, so as I said, that's what you might expect on a desktop system or on a console. Uh, so there are ways of doing this on timers. Uh, now, pixel local storage came from ARM, so I think we can uh, mention it here as a friendly thing. Um, the idea is that you're <coughs> doing the rendering for all of these frames, but you're only storing the value for the tile that you're currently working on, because those are the only pixels you care about, and you pull them back again in the, uh, when you need to consume that to do your final render. Um, but it's not that portable, uh, although it's implemented on quite a few people's hardware now. Um, it's not very practical on a desktop system, which means that probably if you're doing debugging on a desktop system, it won't work. Um, Exactly how much capabilities there are for pixel local storage is variable, so you need different fallback parts according to how much data you're actually trying to use. Um, and the driver doesn't know what you're doing, so it can't do anything to optimize that part. Um, and there are also some restrictions on exactly how you access that memory. Uh, so it's very effective, but it is just an extension, it's not available everywhere. So, how does Vulcan go about this? Um, so, there is uh, far more explicit support inside Vulkan to say how you're going to be using the memory. Um, and the idea is that if you explain everything in advance to the driver, the driver can try to help you out. Uh, and that mapping is complicated if you're controlling it yourself. Um, so, as we'll see, you have to give quite a lot of information to the driver for it to work this out. But on the other hand, if you were trying to handle all possible hardware when you were printing this yourself, you'd still have a lot more support to write. So, please don't cry too hard. So, um, we start out with what a render pass is, and um, the idea is that if you have a series of dependent operations, uh, then they should be grouped together into a single render pass. So if you have your uh, deferred lighting thing here with multiple uh, sub-stages, because they're all rendering the same resolution frame buffer for the final output, uh, they should all be grouped together. Uh, and you do have a restriction that all of those images are the same size. Uh, and that means that for a tiler, for example, things can be broken down uh, so that the work done within a pass is handled within one tile for all of these potentially. Uh, so a render pass has subpasses in it, um, and the subpasses correspond to the different stages of operations we've been given. Uh, and those subpasses work on attachments, which are the image views that we, we were talking about earlier. Um, so in this case, it, the uh, intermediate set values, normal values, um, and that kind of thing are all stored in attachments. Uh, and you have a dependency uh, defined between the subpasses to say which of those attachments are going to be used by one subpass and which are going to be uh, output by others. Uh, and the, uh, so the render pass itself just describes the shape of these operations that we then use. Uh, 
use that to create a render pass instance uh, that can then be put inside the command buffer. Uh, and some type, uh, sometimes, sorry, some renders will need to show the things according to render pass, so you have to group up a bit of the graphics inside the pass. Okay, code, sort of. Um, so if you are creating a render pass, uh, the way you're welcome to do things is you have an object that you hide all of the description stuff into. Um, and in that case, uh, the object that you use to create a render pass has attachments, uh, a list of attachments that are all the images that you're going to be using. Um, no, these are, it's just the descriptions of them, it's not the actual attachments of this one. Um, the uh, description of the subclasses that you're going to be using, uh, and all of these in a set, and the dependencies between the subclasses. And then you create a render pass and you get a render pass out, which we'll show you how to use that in a minute. Uh, so, reminder a render pass is just a template that describes uh, how you're going to be using the render pass, and then you will instantiate that inside the command buffer later on. Right. So, the attachment descriptions. Uh, that's only talking about the, uh, the format, my favorite topic. Um, and number of samples in an attachment uh, talks about what happens when you try to load the attachment. Um, and there are some flags to say that uh, you want to preserve the previous content that was in memory if you want to load that back in. Uh, more likely for a child renderer, you can say you don't care what's previously there because you're going to render over all of it and you can also clear it. Um, and when you're writing something out to an attachment, uh, you can either say you register or, or you can say actually you you're not going to keep that after the render pass is finished. Uh, subclasses uh, have a description of the attachments that are associated with that subclass, uh, what they're outputting to, uh, what they're outputting to around for the fact that they could be handling anti-aliasing, um, and also the list of the attachments that uh, you're not going to modify during that render pass, uh, sorry, that subclass, so that uh, you can have an attachment that will be preserved for use in the latest subclass. There is a diagram happening, I promise. Um, and subclasses are in order, so you can refer to them by a number later on, and they will refer back to previous subclasses. Uh, finally, subclass dependency. Uh, so you can say uh, for an attachment whether it's used, uh, how it's behaving between two subclasses, what source of it is and the destination is. Uh, and which stages have execution requirements between those classes. Uh, yes, please go with the spec for this, but you know, this is a useful um, input for creating everything. Uh, so, we've created our render pass. Uh, to actually use it, we need a frame buffer, and a frame buffer includes the, uh, the attachments, by which mean the, the real attachments this time, the, um, uh, image views that are going to be used to be written to in the subclass. So there's a creating code again, uh, and it has the render pass to say what you're working with, and there's a list of attachments that are associated with it. Uh, and there's also a size specified at this point. So uh, when we're using uh, that, the render pass that we've created, there's a VK command in, which uh, goes inside the command buffer. So <coughs> if you're new to Vulkan, then the VK command is something that gets inserted into a command buffer. Um, and so that takes your render pass template that you already defined, and you turn that into an instance that's actually being used inside your render pass. Uh, and there is a begin info, again, stored in the project, um, that defines the parameters for that. Okay, so diagram, I promise. Uh, so you'll have your attachment descriptions saying what the formatting uh, of the use of those attachments is. Uh, you have the subclass descriptions, which says what, they, uh, what attachments are being used by each subclass. You have your dependencies between the subclasses saying what, uh, what inputs and outputs are being used by each one. And all of those are linked from the render pass creating them. Pass that to create render pass and get a render pass object. Out. Then, when you're trying to use this, we have image views that point to the old memory applications. Uh, we pass that into the frame buffer create info and use that to create a frame buffer. 
Those that both refer to in the Red Past in info, uh, you also need to command buffer to execute on and to pass all of that into the BK begin render pass and magically you started using a render pass. So don't let anybody tell you involved in this complicated system. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, the good news is that you can use a lot of this stuff between different operations, so you don't have to set that absolutely every time there's error. Um, yes, I was about to scan when I first drew this, but please don't scan the scale ball. Um, so, how do we actually render something? Uh, we need to allocate a command buffer, which we had a bit of discussion about already. Um, then we need to begin the command buffer and start actually doing some work. And we've created a command buffer on the right. Um, you need to begin a render pass to actually do any graphics rendering inside it. Uh, and then you can start doing uh, draw operations um, or setting up pipeline stages and other excitement like that. Um, end the render pass to say that you've uh, finished doing operation on one sequence of images. Uh, end the command buffer to say you've done all of that. And then you can pass the command buffer into the uh, command queue um, to actually get some work run on log. Uh, if you wanted to have multiple render passes, uh, so I'll get around that for this one because this is a slightly rarer case, um, you can have more than one render pass inside a command buffer. You're not restricted to a one to one mapping. Um, yeah. um, so. <laughs> 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 Um, so the, uh, if you wanted to write multiple targets from one command buffer, uh, then you can do that by having multiple render passes inside the command buffer. Um, so one reason you might want to do that is to have, uh, to work, decide that you're going to write to a shadow map and environment map for an object and have a command buffer set up to do that, and call the same command buffer to do that every frame. Um, the one complication is that it does have to be the same targets. You can't. Uh, there's no way of mapping from the command buffer to a write to a different output each time. So you can't easily do that to something like the frame buffer because uh, you probably want to point to a different frame buffer output each time. Um, so, and that's because the DK frame buffer is inside the render pass instance. Um, so, as I was saying, we have two issues there. Um, we have two, if we've got two different render passes, they're outputting to different places. So nothing gets held on the chip. It's all being reviewed to object memory, conceptually. Or at least there's no logical connection between them. Um, and if you've got this command buffer, you've got no way of pointing to a different render target. So as I say, you can't double buffer in jackpots or anything like that. Um, so uh, we'll come back to the second problem, the first one. We'll build it now. Um, but sometimes, particularly for things like the shadow map environment, that case I was just talking about, that's still enough to be useful. So, what if you wanted to have more than one subclass? Uh, so, you start in one subclass automatically. So, a, a render pass always has a subclass. Um, and the way you do to the next one is just to call UK command next subclass, which puts that on your command key. Um, and with the dependencies that you set up beforehand, you can say what the connections between those subclasses is. Um, and uh, so because you're still within the same render pass when you're trying to do this, hopefully all the memory accesses for the connections stay on chip, uh, and it'll fall back gracefully if it can't, we hope. Um, so a uh, quick example of functions for doing that. You've got the, uh, creating the command buffer as before, create a render pass, you start doing your rendering, uh, then you switch to the next subclass, do more rendering, uh, end the pass, and the command buffer, and you can submit it. Um, so it's not that much more complicated than doing normal rendering with uh, So fortunately we had a bit of a discussion of this earlier. Um, <coughs> since this was helpful, we not described in the same place with the Vulcan spec as everything else. I thought I'd write it down here. Um, the way you access the contents from the previous uh, uh, subclass inside a sphere B shader um, is uh, an op image read and you have this mapping uh, and from the GLSL extension way of describing that. Um, you have a slightly more readable version that you may recognize looks quite a lot like the pixel of the storage way, if I mean something. Uh, so one aside, if we're uh, keeping all of our intermediate memory accesses on chip, then hopefully we don't need to actually allocate them for them anyway. Um, so you do theoretically 
need to do the application anyway, just in case you're on, a, on something that's not a timer, um, or if the timer fails to cope for some reason. But it's a conceptual allocation. Um, and it, uh, by telling the driver that that's what you're bound to do with that memory, you won't necessarily get anything allocated to it unless you absolutely need it to. Uh, sorry, unless it absolutely needs to. Um, so there are some flags to you take or your image to say that you've got a, a lazy memory for metal. Um, and so if you have a transient attachment and the tiler can keep everything on chip, then it won't have a corresponding memory for it. So uh, that's what subclasses are. Um, the idea is that you've told the driver what you're about to do. Uh, so it can shuffle things around uh, for uh, execution order to try to make sure that uh, the operations happen efficiently and it makes the best use of object memory. Uh, I'm guessing here you could potentially mess with the tile size in order to work out how much memory uh, is needed for the intermediate buffers you've got. Um, you can do some resource balancing. The most important thing is it will fall back rather than you having to worry about this. So if you wanted to use more uh, resources than were available in the big solid storage implementation you were working on, you'd have to write a separate code path yourself. With subclasses, everything will magically work for you. Um, the hardware is probably doing pixel over storage uh, on a tiler, but on the immediate mega renderer, it's probably doing multiple render targets or something like that. Uh, and it does work on immediate mega renderers, so uh, your desktop debugger will still work, and you don't have to have a completely different class when you're trying to debug your code. Um, so, this is one of the rare cases where pixel over storage is actually more explicitly saying what's going on than Vulkan is. Uh, normally Vulkan, you have to tell it exactly what to do, but this time uh, you're just telling the Vulkan driver to sort out the problem for you. Um, so there may be extensions to offer even more control, but uh, it's very useful to have this portable mechanism for them. So uh, we've had a brief talk about secondary command buffers, well, we've had any more detailed talk about it, but secondary command buffers are remarkable. I'm uh, briefly going to talk about them here and how they work with them. Uh, subclasses. Um, so there are two kinds of command buffers when you create them. Uh, the primary command buffers are the ones I've been showing so far. You can have a secondary command buffer as well, um, and that contains things that are going to be invoked by the primary command buffer. Uh, so when you uh, begin a command buffer, uh, there is a way of saying in the secondary command buffer that you're going to inherit uh, information from uh, the primary and that includes the render pass and the sub pass that you'll be on when you're doing that. Um, you can optionally pass through the frame buffer to say what actual destination you're writing to. That, that's optional, which means you can change the frame buffer in the secondary command buffer. Um, so just to clarify that, uh, you need a continue bit because you can't start a render pass in the secondary command buffer. You have to say you're inheriting things. Um, you can do other things in the secondary command buffer. For example, the and the other kind of things that Michael was talking about. Um, and uh, it, but if you're doing graphics rendering, then uh, the render pass that's used by a secondary command buffer comes out of the primary. Uh, so, why do we need to specify the pass for when you're generating the secondary command buffer? Uh, that's uh, because the operations that are being performed. Uh, by the GPU in secondary command buffer will depend on things like format, so you need to have set all that up. Uh, and as I said, the frame buffer is, op is optional, so if you provide it, then a fast path might happen, but otherwise you have the option of having the secondary command buffer uh, able to work with multiple frame buffers. Right. So as Michael said, you can't submit a secondary <coughs> command buffer directly. The point of a secondary command buffer is that you execute it from a primary command buffer. Um, so you have a UK command execute commands in the primary command buffer that takes as its parameter the secondary command buffer that you've already created and links back to uh, so it invokes that in directly um, and uh, just go back there for a sec. Um, so what that might uh, involve doing is patching addresses, for example, in the secondary command buffer if you have uh, specific addresses in your uh, your shader or your uh, state that says where the, um, the textures that are being accessed um, exist. Uh, it doesn't change the frame buffer between the recording of secondary command buffer and it being used. 
primary command buffer might need to go through the secondary command buffer that it's using and make changes there. But hopefully it should be a lot quicker than recording the secondary command buffers with the data from scratch. Um, so uh, you do the begin command buffer and the primary command buffer, create a render pass, there's the command execute commands that calls the secondary command buffer, you might go to the next sub pass, and so on. Uh, so again, the actual code for invoking this isn't that complicated. Uh, most of the complexity involved in setting up the data structures for it. Uh, so, command buffer creation can be a bit slow. Uh, effectively, compression can happen, as, as Michael was saying earlier. Um, this does happen in GLES, it's not that Vulkan is slow. Uh, but the thing about Vulkan is that you get some control when all of this is happening. Um, so by creating uh, secondary command buffers on different threads, uh, that means you can spread the work across multiple CPUs, and there are lots of multiple CPUs out there in the at the moment. Um, and the idea is that the primary command buffer that is just doing command execute commands should be relatively lightweight to construct. Um, so it's still not necessarily directly on the rendering path, uh, it shouldn't slow things down too much, even if it is slow, but the idea is that all it has to do is catch a few addresses at worst. So hopefully that's an easier thing to avoid being a bottleneck. Uh, well, this is supposed to be a talk about passes, but I'm not talking about local command buffers. Um, the render passes are within a primary command buffer, uh, and the, uh, the command buffer has to do the configuration for the GPU with the actual uh, uh, VK frame buffer. Um, so it needs to set up actual memory watches and that kind of thing. Um, rendering happens in the render pass, uh, so if we want that rendering uh, with on-chip accesses to use secondary command buffers, then we need to stay inside the same render pass, which is defined in the, the primary. Um, so because we can't efficiently uh, generate it, the primary command buffer with multiple threads, because as Tom said earlier, there's a, a, um, it, it's a list that you're attacking things off the end of. Uh, the way to do that is to build the secondary command buffers in parallel and then refer to them from the primary command buffer with a relatively lightweight operation. Um, one quick aside, with, uh, while you're in a sub-pass, you can either render to stuff directly, um, which is in line with the example I showed earlier, um, or you can invoke sub-passes. You can't do both at once. Um, and that's defined at the time you begin the render pass. Uh, okay, again, putting things out of my uh, So there's, you can also reuse command buffers. If you're reusing, reusing a command buffer, then you probably want to change what frame buffer it's going to work with. So I mentioned that for the primary command buffers, uh, you can access the same, it will be accessing the same image each time. Sometimes that's all right, sometimes it's not. Um, but if you do want to access different outputs, you'd have to re-record the command buffer. Um, or if you're lucky and you're just alternating between a few uh, frame buffers, then you can just record the command buffer a small number of times and repeat it when you that. That's not a very general solution. The general solution is to use secondary command buffers. Um, and as I was saying earlier, you don't need to uh, use the frame buffer uh, that is available at the time that it was set up uh, in order to, uh, sorry, at the time that the secondary command buffer is invoked. Um, so there's a compatibility, which you can consider they have to be alike enough that the secondary command buffer will still work with it. Um, so you need the same number of formats, you need the same sub-pass count, that kind of thing, in the secondary command buffer. Um, and then you lightweight generate a primary command buffer with different outputs, and then you can get to that. Uh, and as I was saying earlier, you may have to patch addresses or something like that. Um, so, uh, the secondary command buffers just exist. Uh, primary command buffer implication has been should be fairly lightweight. So the total amount of work you're doing is, is reduced, and hopefully we can see that in the information scanner. Uh, so uh, you may have this thinking you've got all these cool effects you can do. Um, but actually, you can't do quite a lot of cool effects at the moment still, because you're only allowed to access the pixel that you're currently working on. Um, so remember that a tile is only working within one tile. And if you wanted to use uh, that pixel to access that pixel's value, 
in order to keep doing work. It would be in a different time, it wouldn't be where you could get it. Um, so you may have a problem uh, uh, dealing with that. Um, and at the moment, the workaround is write everything out of the thing that we would try to avoid. Um, so we really don't want to do that. Um, there are other ways I'm sure you can all think of fixing this. Uh, we've thought of them too, we're working on it. Um, no promises. Right. Uh, so, wrapping up with this point. Uh, render passes, fundamental part of the Vulkan API, um, and we're expecting people to do modern style rendering operations with it. Uh, by giving the driver more to work with, uh, that means that the driver has more information to do your rendering, to do a better job of your rendering workload. Um, and because it's doing the <coughs> work for you, remember that it's helping you, so please don't grumble too much about the amount that you have to type in order to make it with it. Um, and there is some flexibility in here for the drivers to get better, so please don't expect the first pass of drivers to do the best you can possibly achieve with this kind of thing. Um, please use the feature and then we'll see the drivers get better at it. Um, so this is just another way of getting mobile gaming up to console level graphics, as we keep trying to say, Vulcan. Um, I hope you all use it. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm relying on the guys now doing this. Uh, that's me. Email me if there is a question I can't answer now. Any questions? <laughs>